migration. You know, <laughs> I've just published a book here in the U.S. called The Migrant States. And um, it's just the latest example, reflection on this subject that has been uh, part of my life ever since uh, childhood when um, my family moved from the island of Ceylon to England. I was eight years old at the time. I'd been a student at St. Joseph's College in Colombo in the Tamil stream. I like that word stream. That was the word used back then, the Tamil medium. And, um, and we went to London. My, we went to London for a number of reasons. One, because of uh, my brother, Ravanta, who, who, was, who had fallen ill. He had stopped talking and, I, and he, had, he had to be taken out of school. And we were, my parents were at a loss what to do because they didn't quite understand what was going on with him. And then uh, a diagnosis of autism was given. And, and at the time, there wasn't, my parents were looking for treatment for him. And they just identified the Anna Freud Clinic in London as a, as a place to take him if they could get to London. And so my father, who was in the Ceylon Civil Service and in various positions, including uh, Salt Commissioner and Assistant Postmaster General, he, had, he was doing well in his career but he found also um, the limits of advancing in the career for another reason, which is his ethnicity, his, his, de, his, fun, his nature as a Tamil, um, which of course, you know, 1958 took place before I was born. He was at the time assistant government agent in Gaul and his colleagues, Singhalese colleagues helped him escape helped him escape from the mob that came looking for Tamils uh, in office, looking to burn and destroy and kill. I wrote a poem about that called Riot in my book, Uncivil War, where I suggested that if I had not, if he had not been helped by his friends to escape, I would not be here to tell the story. You know, because later on he married and then uh, my elder brother and then myself, the second, we ended up having, my parents having five children. So throughout my childhood in the 60s, which is a childhood in Colombo, I was born in Colombo, though I'm a Tamil from roots in Achavelli and Alavetti um, and Jaffna. Um, from throughout my 60s, though I was a child and I didn't really understand these other, these political issues, these ethnic issues in Sri Lanka, in Ceylon. That was certainly a factor in, in, our, in my parents' thinking about, about where they were going to spend their days and, and where they wanted their children to be educated. And, but I think the principal reason was my brother's condition. And so my father found a way to get a job in the Ceylon High Commission in London. And with that job, we moved uh, to London. And then my parents admitted my son, my, my brother, into the Anna Freud Clinic and, um, and pursued various treatments for him while we were in London. And so migration, you know, they say that the first migration, the largest migration, was from the north to the south, you know, from, from Jaffna, from Achavelli, from Alavetti to the to the city, to, to Colombo. So that was a huge migration from the rural to the, to the urban, from the, um, from cool to, you know, um, I don't know, a different kind of uh, nutrition in, in the capital city. But then another migration across the water from, from the Indian Ocean over to the Atlantic Ocean, to, to England, to another island though interestingly, and I've always lived on islands, most much of my life anyway. So here I, I arrived as an eight-year-old boy in London, and um, I stopped speaking Tamil. I don't know if I did that deliberately to assimilate into the English culture. If I told myself I will never live that life again as a, as a Tamil boy, I don't know. 
but I stopped speaking Tamil and buried it somewhere in my consciousness to the point where I don't speak it anymore. And uh, got to know England, got to know London. Monty Python was the, the television show of the time. Brilliant comics. Uh, Rolling Stones played at Hyde Park in June of 69, uh, a famous outdoor concert. And then I, I got into music, popular music in England. and and I started reading. Uh, I was a slow reader, but then I, I, I speeded up. My father was a poet and a very voracious reader and a fast reader. And I, I, I took him as a model. And then in London, we met Tambi Muttu, who was a great a family member, a, a relation on my mother's side, and sort of a great uncle. And Tambi Muttu had founded Poetry London. And he was a legendary figure in, in poetry. Not a, even before he left the island to go to England, he had published a book, which a copy of which is in the I know in the Colombo Library. I got to manage to see it a couple of years ago. Uh, and anyway, in London, I met Tambi Muttu. He would come home for dinner once a week to our home, and so my father and he would chat, and we would all. And I was an a you know a young boy, but I I was I admired that those conversations and and looked up to that for those figures, both my father and uh, and Tambi Muttu. So I had literary models in my family from my father and Tambi Muttu. I had the experience of migration, the raw experience of being moving from one culture to another, from Ceylon to England the raw experience of leaving one language behind and acquiring another or, or expressing myself only in another. I mean, I was speaking in English from childhood on. So English is also a mother tongue for me, but I, I only speak English once I was in England. Then I started learning French and as, as well in school in England and Latin and Greek. But um, so the migration was, it was a very personal thing. It's just what happened in my life, the story of my family. And it's also, later on, it took on other meanings, the word migration. As I migrated from language to language, you see. Later on, I picked up uh, uh, Spanish and, and then uh, studied French again. And then I got to the point where later on, in my jumping ahead, I was working as an American diplomat in Abidjan, in Cote d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast. And, I, and an Ivorian friend started a sort of poetry session once every weekend in different people's homes. We called it Lecture Tournant du Dimanche, which means the revolving readings on Sundays, but we would actually meet on Saturday evenings. And we would invite politicians, students, uh, academics, uh, different fields uh, to come and recite work, whether it's poetry or short prose, on different themes such as exile or home, and for those sessions, the unifying language of the country was French. I mean, there are 60 languages in Côte d'Ivoire, but French was the one language spoken by everyone. And so I started writing in French to participate in these sessions. I wanted to write poetry in French. It just happened one day that I, I composed a poem in French and then I composed another. I would share them with friends and get their comments and criticism. And then I would read these poems in these sessions. And then eventually I published some of these poems in Ivorian uh, newspapers. And that was an important breakthrough in my migration from one language to another. And then I learned about people like Beckett who, who would write in French and translate themselves back into English. So there were literary models for this experience. And so I kept going, went to Mexico as a... Partly these migrations have also come as a result of my choice of career. You know, I chose at one point in my life to become a diplomat, not for Ceylon, which I could no longer serve, which no longer existed, but, but the United States. And I, and I ended up uh, serving as a diplomat in different countries. And th that meant inevitably movement, voyages, trips, arrivals, goodbyes and migrations between languages. So I ended up in migrating into French, into Spanish, into uh, Haitian Creole, into Portuguese, 
Um, and these are the languages I speak now along and write in, along with English. Curiously, I have not acquired Tamil. I've got, not got it back. I know when I went to Jaffna two years ago, it came up very strongly for me, the desire to learn the language again. But I haven't been able to find, well, at least where I live now in Rockville in Maryland, I haven't made the time or found the teacher to help me along. But I still have this as a project that I want to do. I think it will close the circle and it will be important for me and my poetry to, to make that effort. So I need to make that effort still. But migration has, mean, has meant as a result loss, loss of language, loss of Tamil, for example. But it, it's also mean, meant gains, the acquisition of new tongues, new ways of seeing the world, new islands that remind you of the, the original island. In my case, the, origin, the original island being Ceylon. I keep saying Ceylon, because for me, Ceylon still exists, in, at least uh, um, psychically. Ceylon, I wrote a book once that was published in, in Sri Lanka called Ceylon R.I.P. Rest in peace, Ceylon. But in any case, um, I think um, migration is fundamental to my experience as a human being. And it, 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 then it became fundamental to my experience, my sense of identity. By the way I define myself. I define myself now as a migrant poet, you know, and writing The Migrant States has been a, a breakthrough for me because it's a book about America, about the country to which I ended up, uh, in which I ended up arriving. But it's not just one country, the United States, it's the whole continent. And that my points on the book, I'm speaking not only about the United States, but of Canada, Peru, Chile, the whole region, and what goes on in this region. And, and, and uh, I have various characters in the book, including Walt Whitman, who 200 years ago set off on a journey himself from along the island of Pomonok, now Long Island, uh, to move to the city from the country and the city of New York. And then he's, he traveled in his mind as far away as India. He has a poem, Passage to India, and, and other uh, far-flung places. And he became a poet of the American road and the notion of American democracy. And he became a poet who embraced, uh, as he put it, the Negro, that embra who embraced the other, who embraced uh, a sense of indeterminacy in terms of sexual orientation. He was, a, he was a revolutionary poet in that sense for me, limited in his time too. He was also a very generous person who, who nursed the wounded of the Civil War in the hospitals of Washington during the Civil War. So he, he was an activist, a nurse, and he was sort of America's democratic nurse, you know. And he also invited uh, in his long spread uh, lines, a kind of American expansiveness, you know, a notion that we, you can, this is a vast continent and to be peopled by migrants from wherever they come. And so writing 200 years later about the migrant states, looking back in dialogue with Whitman and so on, has been an interesting intellectual democratic as well exercise for me. And anyway, I'm, as a poet, I, I don't write from nothing. I write from experience. I write from politics. Politics, the affairs of the community, the word, the meaning of that word, politics. So politics has always been a part of my poetry in that sense. I, I write what I know about what's going on in the community. And of course, that, that also means I write about the civil war, which I called the uncivil war uh, in Sri Lanka. I write about the tsunami which I call the splintered face tsunami poem. So I'm just, um, it's just the sort of poet I am. I'm not a poet who, who focus, who tries to eliminate the, re the outside world from his, or his poems, that's all. I, I embrace the outside world, what's going on in the world. Um, and sometimes I hit and sometimes I miss as a, poem, as a poet. When I miss, I say I miss because I use some jargon or something or I, or I don't I don't uh, make the image as precise as it should be 
as clear as it can be. But I try my best. And that trying my best is also my immigrant um, identity. You know, the notion that you can improve yourself, improve your poetry, or whatever it is that you are or do, to the point of uh, achieving some some kind of perfection, or at least uh, aiming for that. You know, Yeats used to write at the end of his life in a poem, what then something to perfection brought, you know, that notion of, of striving for that in, in the verse, in, in the line. So identity for me is the migrant poet. Um, identity for me is Tamil and American. Identity for me is, is Silanese and American. Identity for me is, um, is uh, embracing the other, uh, crossing borders, uh, geographic borders and linguistic borders, trying to present the, the idea, presenting the idea that we should not construct borders in, in our minds or in, or in the world, in the outside world. And, and yet at the same time, I advocate for opening the borders and uh, creating a, a world where we have free passage, you know, and, we, and that we don't need documents to cross over. I write poems about loss, loss also of, of loves. Uh, I mean, I've had a checkered uh, love story in a sense, my life. And I've, but I'm grateful for the experiences that have led to the creation of poems. In the end, it becomes um, uh, very sad, you know, life, life, you may not be happy in your, in your day to day, but if you can make a poem of it, somehow <laughs> you you survive and you go on, you know? And so I make a poem of the day to day, even if the day to day sometimes is not happy, it does not lead to a, a happy conclusion. The poem uh, makes it worthwhile or somehow makes it make sense of it all for me. You must love the land when you leave to build your house on the sea, love what's lost, the mango tree burning in the garden, the curious noose of the familiar coat of arms, love the ball turning strong, spinning in a dark, faraway land, love the tongue you'll never again speak that wrapped you and bled you and dried up some every day on the other side of the sea. The elephants are in the yard. I see the elephants in the yard. Papa, the white snake too, peering out of the neem tree's trunk, hissing poisons. Papa, I see the wild boar in the thicket, the branches burning with his smell. Papa, bring out your gun. I want to eat the boar's meat and stare at his head on my wall. Papa, I see the elephants in the yard. The partridge and jungle fowl you shot from the air and bush to conquer alone the harvest of the jungle. You were always a sport, took on bird in flight, bow in fierce charge, your life or his. I see the elephants in the yard and poachers cock-eyed, devouring their tusks in dreams, building grand compounds, massing riches in stainless steel. Papa, the sport is finished. The elephants are in the yard and there is no forest and there are lots of knives and forks and tractors and babies to feed and gorillas hiding in the shade of neem and mango right there beyond the veranda in the center of the garden where your dowry will build your last daughter's house. The elephants spread their heavy bodies tired from the journey up country and down country, the long herding to some safe, peaceful house. Eyes beyond the border. Eyes beyond the border, cry bullets. Leafing within the mattress, I found a hare after many months looking. It lay still in my hand, like a hand grenade. Going to Volcanoes National Park, I buried the hare under a cactus plant. Later, I played billiards for money, dreamt of cancer eating my flesh, and used language like shrapnel. Injured a few passers-by going to the park with fruit and wine to appease the volcano. Chattering, sputtering, 
bullets and grenades, lava flows over fruit and wine, cactus plant. To appease or not to appease. In this house, five miles as the lava flows, old letters and other memorable fancies, bangles, breath mints, screwing in graveyards, a second hair under the floorboards. We had gone for a sea bath and had just sat down to eat mangoes and pitto, a spicy pole sambal. My husband was thrilled with home food and sea air. The orchids, the waiter, arranged elaborately on our table. I wanted the flowers moved because they blocked my view of the sea. But my husband insisted. He said the waiter had taken such trouble. And in the States, how often would we eat mangoes by an ocean framed with orchids? Those were his last words. When the first wave roared over us, I held on to a palm tree. Then, as the water receded, ran and ran uphill. Met our friends there, but my husband stayed behind. I do not have his body. Just these words about flowers. His grin as he sucked mangoes with his hands. Fire Department. Where is your village burning? Where is your village mined fields? Where is your village blasted in crossfire, wounded under jungle trees? Where is your village running across marshes, shot in the back? Where is your village waving white flags, frisked, registered, supervised in a camp? Where is your village blowing up army friskers, other villagers? Where is your village, Toronto, Berlin, Tamil Nadu? Where is your village? Madagascar as option has not been discussed. Where is your village? Hasta la vista, special envoy. Where is your village burning? Avocado season is over. The season of avocados is over. The most beautiful girl in town is about to marry a man across the water. My brother is busy with his manuscript. Time to share ideas in a book has gone to the country without a hat. Accept reality. Don't live any more in fantasy. You are getting along in years, but have only spoken Creole for two. You have a great long life ahead. Think, reflect, tell all the new families, congratulations, good luck. Then write again about your life in Haiti when the avocado was in bloom.